Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers and Maya in particular for giving me the opportunity to be at one of the most extraordinary conferences I have attended in the recent past. Um, I have been able to attend many of the, most of the sessions in fact, and um, it's been such a ferment of ideas that I'm uh, accessing through these presentations and I see a new Georgia being conceptualized, shaped and produced by this generation and it's a very exciting moment uh, and I'm very honored to be here at this time. Um, in my uh, lecture, which I will read, I am uh, trying to bring together uh, ways of thinking from different fields which raise questions about how we should think about knowledge and um, theory. And when I use the term Global South, as Maya said as well, the term Global South does not refer to a geographical region, nor to a category within a developmental discourse, but is intended to indicate a space of thought, a possibility of reworking the coordinates of intellectual work to free ourselves from the tyranny of Eurocentric universalizing narratives and to destabilize the East-West distinction that is routinely made in the context of thought and intellection. This might make spaces within the global North part of the global South. For instance, uh, the thought of indigenous people in the Americas and Australia, perhaps some parts, parts of Europe, and over the last two days I've been thinking perhaps Georgia, uh, some parts of Europe around the Mediterranean, for example, or parts of Eastern Europe uh, with histories that cut through any neat continental divisions. I've been very inspired by a particular statement of the uh, philosopher Walter Mignolo uh, who said, I am where I think. Uh, that is, you constitute yourself, I am, in the place where you do and think. Now, this statement is not a claim to indigeneity or authenticity or superiority vis-a-vis -vis the West, uh, which I'm, you have to assume the quotation marks around the term East and West. Now, such a stance, that is a claim to indigeneity and authenticity vis-a-vis -vis the West, is a stance very familiar to us in India from the Hindu nationalist framework. Rather, it is an insistence on privileging location. So the statement is not about claiming indigeneity or, or authenticity vis-a-vis -vis the West, but it's an insistence on privileging location, a recognition that spatial and temporal, temporal coordinates, uh, coordinates of time and space, uh, inevitably suffuse all theorizing. A sensitivity to location would invariably lead to a productive contamination of the purity of empty universalist categories with specific histories, thus challenging their claim to speak about everywhere from nowhere. In India, sections of intellectuals had been articulating a critique of intellectual colonization in a sustained way from the 1930s, at least. In 1954, a journal called Vishwabharati Quarterly, published by Rabindranath Tagore, who, as we know, uh, was held in very low esteem by Tabitze, as we saw in Shota's presentation. Um, so he had founded a university, Ashantini Ketan, and that university published the Vishwabharati uh, Quarterly. Um, and this lecture, um, which was delivered in 1931 uh, by uh, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, uh, 18, 16 years before India's independence, was titled Swaraj in Ideas. Now, Swaraj means self-rule and it was used in very comp complex ways in the Indian uh, anti-imperialist struggle to refer both to home rule in terms of nationalism but also to rule over one's self. Gandhi used the word Swaraj in those kinds of ways. So you can see that Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya also is thinking about Swaraj in ideas to refer to ways in which Indians could decolonize their minds. So this is in the 1930s. Now Bhattacharya extended the notion of Swaraj or self-determination to the realm of ideas, calling cultural domination a subtler form of political domination. He nevertheless was clear that assimilation of an alien culture 
was not necessarily subjection. And in fact, assimilation of new and foreign ideas may be necessary for progress. So he was not afraid of uh, new ideas. What is cultural subjection, he said, is when, and I'm quoting him, when one's traditional cast of ideas and sentiments is superseded without comparison or competition by a new caste representing an alien culture which possesses one like a ghost, unquote. So the Indian mind, said Bhattacharya, has subsided below the conscious level of culture for, for men and women who have been educated uh, in the Western style. Um, and the Indian mind now operates, that is at that time, operates only at the level of family life and in some social and religious practices. Meanwhile, Western ideas, springing as they do, he said, from a rich and strong life, the life of the West, they induce in us a shadow mind that functions like a real mind, except in the matter of genuine creativeness. So for genuinely creative thought, according to Bhattacharya, for Swaraj and ideas, the new Western knowledge must be located, not rejected, not, not, uh, not be afraid of it, but to locate the new Western language within the terrain of the rich and strong life of Indian society. And uh, we've seen that there's been this kind of attempt to uh, escape or rework a uh, Western canon of knowledge that has come into uh, Indian academic life in many kinds of ways in India. So scholars associated with the Lucknow School of Economics, for example, and sociology, late 1950s to early 1960s, trespassed the borders of disciplines and were concerned with how Indian civilization and community responded to the nationalist project of planned development. Uh, other scholars based in Delhi, such as Ashish Nandi, T.N. Madan, Rajni Kothari, you understand I'm only speaking about a very narrow slice of Indian intellectuals uh, who were writing in English. We're not even talking about the large range of work in the 22 Indian, official Indian languages. Um, but they were at the center of, uh, so Nandi, Madan, Kothari from the 1980s onwards were at the center of intellectual attempts to understand the specificities of what could be called Indian culture and politics, trying to bring to bear a general critique of universal notions of modernity on concepts such as secularism and democracy in India. Such critiques, however, remained at the margins. And in fact, often uh, scholars like Nandi, at least in the 80s, were thought of as being indigenous, playing into the hands of the Hindu right, and so on. Uh, because academic institutions generally set up very unproblematically Eurocentric canons. The organizing, organization of knowledge production and transmission in universities all over the Global South is based on the disciplinary model developed in Western universities over the 19th and 20th centuries. That is to say, while the earliest institutions of higher learning are found from the 5th century uh, uh, onwards in what is now South and West Asia, the particular form that the university took in Europe in the 19th century has come to assume the form uh, of the only legitimate model of higher education. This was, of course, not always the case. Knowledge flowed the other way in an earlier age. Ugandan scholar Mahmoud Mamdani points out that the graduation gowns seen all over the modern world are derived from the Islamic madrasas of West Asia, and the early universities of Europe, Oxford, Cambridge, and the Sorbonne, borrowed not just these gowns, but much of their curricula from these institutions. Greek philosophy to Iranian astronomy to Arab medicine and Indian mathematics. They had little difficulty at that time uh, in accepting this flowing gown modeled after the dress of the desert nomad as the symbol of higher learning, he says. In his, um, sorry, I'm just. In his study of colonial education in India, scholar Sanjay Seth makes it clear that there was not one indigenous knowledge that confronted modern Western education, but several knowledges and practices differentiated by the intended users and the groups and castes to whom they were available and from whom they were restricted. And I do want to obviously just state here that once again, that when one looks at these kinds of different kinds of indigenous knowledges that confront modernity, there is, 
no way in which I'm suggesting that it was somehow some kind of glorious past. We are talking of other kinds of hierarchies, caste in India, for example. We're talking of other forms of ex exclusion. So the idea is not to produce some idea of a golden past which was destroyed by modernity and the West, but simply to resist the universalizing thrust of what the Enlightenment uh, has meant. Um, so, what uh, Sait is saying in his study of colonial education in India is that the, what the trait that these indigenous knowledges shared, uh, or what all pre-modern knowledges uh, had in common, Western and Indian, uh, is that unlike the rationalization associated with modernity, which freed knowledge from substantive contexts and made it in principle independent of its actual uses, in traditional learning, the content and form are indistinguishable. You don't learn the theory of nursing and then go separately and learn the practice of nursing. This is the example that he uses. You learn it in the doing of it. This is how pre-modern knowledge has worked. It's only with rationalizing that increase, with rationalization brought about by modernity that increasingly knowledges and skills that could be learned in the doing now presuppose a mastery of the theory which it is assumed can be independently learned. Moreover, the knowledge of theory is assumed to be superior to merely learning by practice. Said argues that knowledges are not forms of cognizing a world external to them, but rather are constitutive of this world. Modern knowledge then reworks the world and its past in terms comprehensible only within itself. Sait correctly points out the ethical unsustainability of this position, which characterizes our contemporaries who have other notions of knowledge as somehow inhabiting a past that we have left behind. They are our contemporaries, but they live in the past. Uh, tribal knowledge, knowledges, the knowledges of indigenous peoples, the knowledge of uh, castes that have worked with their hands. They're in the 21st century with us, but somehow they inhabit a past, where, whereas we have entered today. From this perspective, even alternative nationalist visions of education did not escape the normalizing thrust of modern Western knowledge. That modern Western knowledge became identified with knowledge as such, is in Sanjay Seth's words, as much the fruit of nationalist strivings as it is of colonial imposition. So this is the way in which uh, the nationalist elites were also hegemonized because this was a desire of the whole entire world to become like Europe, to become modern, to grow up and enter the world of adults that Europe represented. The idea of applying theory produced in one context to understand practice in another assumes that political practice is non-theoretical, completely bereft of any discursive theoretical content, so that any theory from the West can be used to make sense of political practice anywhere. But all political practice is in fact always constituted by some form of reflection and thought, theoretical or non-theoretical, and as we realize painfully today, at least one part of that theorization must be about making sense of practice through an understanding of the subject's own world and her categories of thought. What these dense debates indicate is that the East-West distinction is a sterile one, as is the tradition modernity binary. For instance, the complaint that Indians are hypocritical in maintaining an outward allegiance to modernity while remaining pre-modern in their selfhood is a common one among modernizing Indian elites even today, articulated within a discourse of our incomplete modernity. Somehow we're simply not modern enough. We pretend to be modern, but deep down inside we're not. A remarkably insightful response to this can be found in A.K. Ramanujan's brilliant little essay, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking?, in which he shows how in the context sensitive, that is pre-modern Indian way of life, the context free, that is the modern, becomes simply yet another context. What is understood to be universal modernity sweeping everything before its path becomes in India merely one of many contexts within which people work and between which they move seamlessly. Ramanujan's theoretical innovation lies in stepping away from the field of the dichotomized modernity tradition binary as well as the notion of alternative modernities that leaves normative modernity unquestioned. His framework in which context-free modernity is merely another context, 
is not, I think, a unique Indian phenomenon, but has theoretical purchase globally. The computer programmer anywhere in the world observing a religious fast for Lent, for Ramzan, or for Navratri is an instance of Ramanujan's insight because that computer programmer is occupying the context-free world of Silicon Valley but is simultaneously going to go home or, or through the day observe a religious fast which is supposedly context sensitive. So the point that Ramanujan was making about India is I think a wider theoretical point globally that in fact we don't live in fully context free not even in Europe, not even in Silicon Valley, do people live in fully universalized, context-free spaces. The context-free is one more context. That is, every computer programmer is using the same language, but then that computer programmer leaves the computer programming behind and goes on to think about life and death and the big questions in his or her own culturally inflected way. Thus, while the hegemonic drive of modernity did colonize the imagination globally, it never quite managed to hermetically seal all its borders. This is the insight that we can take away from Ramanujan. There are at least three tasks before us in the process of engaging with the thought of the global south. The first has in fact been substantially carried out by now, um, that is the critique of Eurocentrism. And I may not spend too much time on it. Uh, so if we can just very briefly define Eurocentrism as a set of assumptions about the universal universalizability of the European slash Western experience, and the, secondly, the telos of progress and history. If we can think about, if we can very briefly agree that that's a workable definition of Eurocentrism. Um, from this position, the non-West becomes a place of data and facts which must be excavated and theorized in the neutral conceptual frameworks that have evolved in the West. From this point of view, either the non-West is always lacking, modernity is incomplete, secularism is impure, democracy is immature, development is arrested, capitalism is retarded. Um, or the non-West can be translated perfectly into Western terms with questions like, is there civil society in the Global South? Are there conceptions of equality in the in, in South? Were there liberal thinkers? What kind of modernity do they have? Franz Fanon put it this way, if ever the colonized do arrive, everything is already anticipated and demonstrated. Now, of course, while concepts emerging from Western, that is Euro-American social philosophy, are assumed to contain within them the possibility of universalization, the reverse is never assumed. So, can, for instance, is, uh, can, for instance Nerere's concept of Ujama from Africa, uh, or the trope of Draupadi as the ambiguous figure of assertive femininity from the Indian epic Mahabharata, can they be ever considered relevant to analyze Euro-American experience? But Antigone can be made to speak about war everywhere. The second task, so that was the first task, which I'm very quickly going through because this task has been, I think, in the last, uh, since at, at least since Said's Orientalism, this task has been at least made visible as a task to be performed. The second task, uh, I would suggest, is to go beyond post-colonial critiques of Eurocentrism, uh, post-colonial theories, object of critique, which is empire, and to unpack West and non-West. Much of modern thought in the non-West has in fact engaged with Western no notions and vernacularized them, which is a term uh, Shudipta Kaviraj uh, uses. He, he uses the analogy of speaking English with different accents, uh, how your, your native language inflects English. So, to vernac so these Western notions have been vernacularized. Uh, but equally, so, so the, it's not very clear that we can actually hold on to this notion of a West and a non-West because already the non-West has engaged with Western thought. I'm speaking in English, it's my first language. We've already engaged with Western notions. But equally, Western knowledge formations, and that, this is the point that I think we tend, we need to pay more attention to, uh, that so-called Western knowledge formations have deep roots in the non-West. Uh, in his controversial book, Black Athena, Martin Bernal points out that until the 19th century, 
Greek culture was accepted to have arisen from incorporation in the, into the Egyptian and Phoenician empires, thus resulting in a mixture of European, African, and Arabic civilizational influences. It was only in the first half of the 19th century in Europe that the viewing of Greece as essentially European or Aryan begins, coinciding with post-enlightenment notions of progress as well as the beginning of institutionalized racism. During this period, a body of scholarship arose, identifying Greece as the cradle of European civilization, and it was intolerable to such scholars that Greece should be identified, as it had been for centuries, as Levantine or Medita Mediterranean, an area that included all the countries around the Mediterranean Sea, North Africa, West Asia, and Southern Europe. After all, the supposedly natural division into continents, Europe, Africa, Asia, is not any more natural than dividing up the world through oceans. Spatially, uh, North Africa, West Asia, and Southern Europe are more contiguous to one another than to other parts of their continents. And increasingly, scholars of oceanic studies are arguing that oceans have not historically separated pieces of land, but have acted as conduits of communication. Similarly, Mahmoud Bamdani, reading Ibn Khaldun's Mukaddima, suggests that it may be productive to think of Africa before the Atlantic slave trade in regional rather than continental terms in an imagination that brings together the Mediterranean and West African regions in a single history, a la Bernard. We need to recognize and recover what Mignolo calls decolonial cosmopolitanisms, because there's a way in which we talk about cosmopolitanism uh, as if it is something that has now emerged and this is a new phenomenon and we need to address it. But this really, there, is, there are decolonial histories of cosmopolitanism that go way back. Um, so, uh, to, uh, for example, if you look at the west coast of India, uh, why does the state of Kerala have the early, one of the earliest Christian communities in the world, one of the earliest Muslim communities in the world? In the lifetime of Christ, in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, traders have come and they have become part of Kerala society. So there, there is, cosmopolitanism precedes uh, what is understood uh, to be cosmopolitanism today. Take, for instance, uh, an example of the example of Ibn Rushd, a key 12th century figure who developed the Aristotelian distinction between form and matter to assert human free will, which mediates between essence and existence. In the debate in Islam between reason and revelation, Ibn Rushd asserted that it was the philosopher, not the theologian, who was who had the uh, legitimacy to establish the true inner meaning of religious beliefs in the event of a dispute because of his ability to deal with doubt, ambivalence, and criticality. He placed the philosopher above the theologian. He placed reason above revelation. Now, what is interesting is that in the period between the 8th and the 15th centuries, the Islamic world experienced a continuing struggle between faith and mysticism on the one hand and reason on the other, and eventually Ibn Rushd and the party of reason were set aside. But in 12th century Europe, Ibn Rushd emerged as the standard bearer of the rebels against Catholic authoritarianism, calling themselves the Averroists, because Ibn Rushd was known as Averroes in Europe. These Christian intellectuals had read Aristotle in Latin translations as well as through the extensive co commentaries of Arab Aristotelians. And for them, they made no distinction between Christian, pagan, and Muslim authorities while arguing points of Christian doctrine. The church, of course, reacted with anxiety and brutality through the first half of the 13th century, wiping out the mass movement of the Qatars, banning Ibn Rushd's commentaries on Aristotle, and then the study of Aristotle himself. However, Ibn Rushd continued to remain a powerful force in the European Renaissance. Hoskoti and Trojanov point out that while European accounts usually reduce the contribution of Arabic thinkers to European philosophy, treating them as some kind of couriers safeguarding and forwarding European philosophical treasures. In fact, Arabic thinkers or the Falasif were philosophers themselves, who through erudite commentary, polemic and teaching, paved the way for critical inquiry. Now this story that I have just related is told very differently by European scholar Umberto Eco. So for Eco, who in his essay on translation, Ibn Rushd or Averroes is a and I quote Eco, a blatant example of cultural misunderstanding, unquote. 
because in, in Eco's reading, Averroes wrote his commentary on Aristotle's poetics knowing no Greek and hardly any Syriac. He read Aristotle through a 10th century Arabic translation of a Syriac translation of the Greek original. Eco calls this a mishmash. And he says, to increase this mishmash, poetics was accessed in Europe in a Latin translation of Averroes' commentary uh, to the poetics in Arabic. Now what Eco sees as a mishmash was a massive and complex project of translation located on a bridge between languages in the 12th century in which texts began to flow in various directions among Greek, Arabic, Hebrew and Latin and into the emerging languages of Castilian, French and Italian. So uh, to quote Hoskote and Trojanov again, a special process of collaborative translation was developed Usually a Jew, occasionally a Muslim, translated the Arabic text orally into Romance or Castilian, and then a Christian rendered this oral version into written Latin. The Jewish interpreters and Latin scribes also translated Greek originals and the Arabic commentaries. Thus, translation in the 12th century was a massive philosophical project, but eco living in late 20th century nation state bounded words with national languages and other languages being dismissed as mere dialects, Eco can only see this as a mishmash. And Eco really is us. I, do, I don't mean to put him down. He's, he is one of my favorite writers. But this is the only way in which once the nation state borders have been established, uh, you can see a project like this, mishmash. That's all he can see it as. But the point that I have tried to make is that the West and the non-West are not independent spaces of thought. The third and most important task, so the second task was to unpack this West-non-West -West binary. And I think that's a task that can take us another decade at least. The third and most important task we must engage in is to identify the concepts internal to other knowledge traditions through which intellectual conversations take place. What kind of debates have taken place? What have been the key issues of debate? Equally importantly, we must not treat the non-West as a homogenous space because there's always, there, there is that danger with post-colonial thinking. There is the empire and then there is the non-empire. But we cannot treat the non-West as a homogenous space. We have to make visible the internal voices of dissent and debate within non-Western knowledge formations. In what terms is criticism conducted and dissent expressed? Thus, we must listen in on conversations internal to cultures uh, as, as well as between the West and the non-West. These tasks uh, uh, centrally foreground the question of language and translation. Um, I found it quite useful to consider an argument made by Peter Winch, who, writing about the relationship between language and reality, sorry, uh, language and reality, do you mind if I don't want to go over time. Um, an argument made by Peter Winch, who, uh, writing about the relationship between language and reality, makes a distinction between two kinds of languages. One is a set of linguistic conventions, such as, say, English, French, and so on. In, when one knows one language and wants to learn another, one remains within the same world, learning English names for the objects and experiences one already knows in French. Thus, when one learns to command, say in English, to say do this, one is not learning to command per se. But the difference is, so that's one kind of translation which uh, is not difficult because you, the conceptual universes are the same. You're familiar with the conceptual universes. But there's another kind of difference between, and, and that's not the difference between, say, the languages of science, modernity, and non-modernity. Uh, so uh, he then suggests that there's another kind of translation problem, and that arises with languages like, say, mathematics or science where learning the language is learning to do and produce a new universe. When one learns to do something mathematically, you, are, you can only speak it in the language of mathematics. Two plus two is four, is not translatable into some other language. When you learn two plus two is four, 
When you learn 2 plus 2 is 4, you uh, uh, learn both the language and the doing of it. Now, thank you. So what happens is that when, when, one, when one thinks of translation in this way, that it's about translate, translating conceptual universes, you're learning a new action that can only be performed in that language. So let me give you an example of secularism in India, the term secularism. Debates over secularism in India stumble in the very first instance over the translation into Hindi. Now already we are assuming therefore that the word secularism which has come from the West needs to be translated into an Indian language because the word does not exist in Indian languages and then therefore surely the concept cannot possibly exist in Indian languages. Um, now, if you look at the translations, and I'm going to use the word translations in quotation marks here because they're not really translations. There are two ways in which the term secularism is used in, 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 in Hindi. Uh, one of which, and the two mean actually different kinds of things. One, Sarvadharma Samabhav, means that the state must treat all religions equally. This is Sanskritized, it's produced, it's a, it's a concocted translation. It means the state must treat all religions equally. And the other term that is used is dharm nirpekshita, which means that the state must maintain equal distance from all religions. Treating all religions equally, maintaining equal distance from all religions are actually subtly different, but they suggest very different modes of engagement between politics and the state and religion. However, for decades, these two phrases were seen as simply translating the English concept in some deficient way. Somehow our language is just not, our language and our political experience is simply not good enough to get this, this modern idea of secularism. Um, but in fact, these two terms, uh, these two phrases, uh, in fact, are closer to traditions in the Indian subcontinent, where multiple religious, religious and cultural communities have coexisted whether affably or by deftly managing conflict over centuries. In the Indian subcontinent, no philosophical tradition, whether Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic or Sikh, has seen the state as separate from religion. And yet the state and religion were never fused, as in medieval Christianity. Recognizing these difficulties, the framers of the Indian constitution decided not to use the term secularism at all. It was inserted 26 years later through a constitutional amendment uh, at a very authoritarian period in Indian history. In political discourse, however, secularism became quite a central category and assumed a self-evident and already accomplished state of being when in fact the task was to learn an entire universe of doing. The complicated ways in which left parties and movements in India have had, have had to negotiate religious and cultural uh, practices for a long time seen as necessarily regressive. Uh, and the new formulations of what secularism can be in the face of the Hindutva onslaught, the Hindu right-wing onslaught, are indications of the enormity of the task uh, before us regarding knowledges old, new and reconstructed, and the radically different universes languages can give birth to. Guinean scholar Siba Grovagi talks of how it's impossible to talk about many common concepts from the discipline of international studies in African languages, for their political societies are radically different. In Guinea, for example, there have been stateless or acephalous societies, to, he says, to, for whom, to whom the notion of great power responsibility would make no sense. And of course, the term stateless already assumes the modern state to be the norm. You are deprived, you're deficient in not having a state. There's a term which immediately places you in the less stateless category. Another comparable problem arises in translating across African languages with their different histories. Japanese philosopher Naoki Sakai sees translation as having to assume what he calls a heterolingual mode of address, which assumes, I quote him, a non-aggregate community of foreigners. That is, translation must assume mutual foreignness between language communities. Rather, what translation tends to assume, so what he's suggesting is very different from what translation tends to assume, which is a homolingual address that assumes the normalcy of reciprocal and transparent communication in a homogeneous medium. In a heterolingual mode of address, the addressee could respond with varying degrees of comprehension, including missing the signification completely. 
the heterolingual address thus assumes that every utterance can fail to communicate because heterogeneity is inherent in every medium and therefore translation is endless. All knowledge production must start with one's location with the questions about the world that puzzle you from your vantage point. A comparative dimension is inescapable. Issues in other parts of the world at one level seem familiar to those in one's own, but they get articulated in unfamiliar ways, while concerns specific to a location nevertheless resonate, echoing predicaments faced by, uh, faced by us at some other place or in some other time. It's after all not just a question of translating words from one language to another, it is about engaging with entire ways of life and modes of thinking arising from different trajectories of time and space. Let me give you one and maybe two examples if one has time. Uh, this is from the Indian context. Uh, there was a controversy that erupted in 2015 over the Jain, uh, the, uh, the practice of the religious community of Jains. Uh, the practice is called Santhara. This practice involves voluntarily starving to death at a particular stage in one's life. I should say, that in, for those who may not be familiar, that Jainism is one of the, one of the new religions that broke away from Hinduism, uh, rejecting the caste system, rejecting the, the superiority of the Vedas. But it has been assimilated back into Hinduism by Indian law. Nevertheless, it's actually a very specific religious set of practices. So Santhara is the practice among Jains of deciding to voluntarily give up one's life at some stage, usually at a late stage as, as you uh, let's say past middle age. Uh, so, uh, so what happens uh, with the Santhara practitioner is that they basically relinquish food and drink voluntarily they arrive at this decision after calm and unruffled introspection with an intent to cleanse oneself of karmic encumbrances and thus attain the highest stage of transcendental well-being. So Santhara is uh, an act of spiritual purification and it is assumed and it assumes in a sense the exercise of individual autonomy that I decide now that I have lived a full and complete life and I am now ready to leave. Now this practice is, is is common among Jains and it's celebrated, it's, it, the entire community celebrates a person's decision to do this and so on. Now this practice was challenged by a public interest litigation in Rajasthan High Court in 2006. And in India, the practice of, I mean suicide is a, is, is, is a crime and therefore uh, Santhara was challenged as an act of suicide and a ruling was given by the High Court of the state Rajasthan in 2015 that Santhara amounted to suicide and it is, it is therefore a crime under the Indian Penal Code. And the Supreme Court stayed the order and has lifted the ban on Santhara but the decision has not been taken. But it has simply shifted the question, the Supreme Court, to whether essential and integral parts of a religion can be restricted by the state. Uh, what remains unexamined is the presumed opposition between the particularity, supposed particularity of a Jain religious practice, so I'm going to say particularity and religious in quotation marks, as opposed to the universality of the state's legal practice. So particularity, religion, universality, legal. So it looks like that. So there's this little community which wants to do something crazy. Is this appropriate? Does it fit in with the Indian universal Indian legal system? But interestingly, a person who made a film on this practice, Shekhar Hatangari, uh, forces us to reformulate this opposition as one between competing contexts. That is to remember what Ramanujan said, this is not a competition between the context-free law and the context-sensitive Jain practice of Santhara. But Hatangani is forcing us to think about this as actually two contexts, that both are contexts. Why is that? The Santhara, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him but mostly quoting him, the Santhara case serves to emphasize the seemingly irrecon irreconcilable difference in perspective on the specific issue of suicide. 
In contrast to a Christian believer who looks upon the human body as a God-given temple of the human soul and therefore beyond the realm of willful and deliberate destruction by any human being, a devout Jain views that same body as a prison of the human soul, the fulfillment of whose needs corresponds to the accumulation of bad karma. The basic contradiction so the basic contradiction is really between Indi the Indian Penal Code, which is passed on to us unchanged from British colonialism. The Indian Penal Code is exactly what uh, British colonialism gave us. Now, British colonial law is based on the British Christian worldview. And that is why suicide is a crime. It's a crime because it is not your right. The body is not yours. The body is given to you by God. God will, if you're a suicide, you're buried in an unmarked grave under Christianity. But that's not the way Hindus and Jains think about death. They think about leaving this body as liberation. So his point is that the law is theologically inflected. The law is not some neutral uh, uh, space. Um, so the basic contradiction between a law founded largely on a Christian-inspired bioethic and the essentially Eastern variant of the idea of spiritual advancement through abstinence and renunciation rears its head whenever an ancient religious practice like Santara coincides with contemporary law. Hatangari's analysis enables us to see that what is presented as secular law is also deeply rooted in the specific religious worldview of the British. Now the point is not to replace a Christian-inspired law with a Hindu one. The point is to recognize that, as Carl Schmitt puts it, all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. Um, I have another 15 minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, OK. So another instance, then, which I'd like to share with you of rethinking uh, euronormality, which is a term that Kaviraj uses, is evident in the field of psychoanalysis. Um, it has seemed to many scholars that Freudian psychoanalysis universalizes as a human condition what is essentially a narrowly parochial experience, that of male European modernity. Indian psychoanalysts have long struggled with what they saw as the difference between Indian and Western patients when it comes to becoming proper, modern, masculine subjects. Girin Rushekhar Bose, who founded the Indian Psychoanalytical Society in 1921, wrote to Freud, that my Indian patients do not exhibit castration symptoms to such a marked degree as my European cases. The desire to be a female is more easily unearthed in Indian male patients than in European. The Oedipus mother is very often a combined parental image, and this is a fact of great importance. So he writes to Freud as a practic practicing psychoanalyst in 1921 in India, seeing both European and Indian patients, that perhaps we could discuss Oedipus in a slightly more complex way. And Freud replies very politely. He promises to keep in mind these differences, but warns against any hasty decisions. Because you cannot universalize sitting in India. You can only universalize sitting in Vienna. You can only talk about your patients and universalize on the basis of that. So Girin Shekhar Bose, Bose's letter in which he uh, is expecting to enter into a conversation with Freud is quite uh, easily and patronizingly dismissed as yes, that's yes, yes, that's very interesting, but don't universalize too hastily. Um, Sudhir Kakar, a practicing psychoanalyst, has tried to vernacularize the theory. In fact, practicing Indian psychoanalysts do try to vernacularize the theory and to use it as a method uh, in uh, the radically different cultural landscape uh, that he's working in in India, while rejecting its substantive conclusions as Eurocentric. And this is, in fact, what a lot of Marxists in the Global South do, Marxism as method rather than Marxism as substantive content. Now, uh, he, um, so he actually talks about, I'll very, I won't go into the details of it, but he talks about uh, the, the, the very powerful figure of the goddess, the Devi, in the Indian cultural landscape. Um, and uh, he finds it, therefore, uh, important to understand the formation of the Indian male psyche in particular with, the, with regard to a powerful mother. And what he does is, and of course these myths are not myths in the way Greek myths are myths for Europe. These are living cultural religious traditions. They're not at all myths like, uh, like Greek and Roman myths. 
uh, their symbolic power is intact, they're, they're vibrantly alive. Now, Kakar tells a familiar story from Hindu mythology of uh, Skanda and Ganesha, sons of Parvati and Shiva, competing to win a fruit offered by their mother as a gift to whichever of, whichever of them raced around the universe first. When Skanda triumphantly returns after circumnavigating the universe, he finds Ganesha ensconced at his mother's feet, eating the fruit. Because he had circumambulated his mother, worshipped her and declared, you are my universe. So Skanda did the whole thing and Ganesha flattered his mother. And Ganesha is given the fruit. Furious, Skanda rushes away to an inaccessible mountaintop to which an annual pilgrimage is conducted to this day. All these four are Hindu gods who are worshipped here today. Now, what the point that Kakar is making is that Skanda's punishment is exile from the mother's bountiful presence and the reward, what is the reward? The reward is the promise of functioning as an autonomous adult man. Ganesha remains the infant and his reward is never to know the pangs of separation from the mother. The story, says Kakar, indicates how Indian and European cultures have entirely opposite notions about adulthood, individuation and autonomy. For in the European understanding, it is Skanda who has become the proper adult man. But in the Indian understanding, he is the loser, he lost, he's punished by being, his punishment is to be autonomous. Thus, even while remaining within the framework of Freudian psychoanalysis, Kakar enables a deconstruction of the universality assumed by psychoanalysis for itself. There are other interesting instances of Indian myths, uh, because Freud assumes that all of us, he in fact says in this famous quote, he says, uh, it is the fate of all of us perhaps to direct our first sexual impulse towards our mother and our first hatred and first murderous wish against our father. But Indian mythology is full of young, virile men who give up their sexuality for their fathers so that their fathers can have sex with younger, beautiful women who say, I will not have sex with you because you already have a son and I want my son to be king. And these sons give up. Their, they make the promise to remain celibate forever and they're rewarded with power, they're rewarded with kingship. Uh, so this is not... It's not parasite, which is the governing myth in Hinduism. It is giving young men giving up their virility for their old fathers. So let me conclude uh, then uh, with um, I'm going to I was going to talk about notions of the self, but I think it's it's uh, really getting very late, right? I have we started actually at 7:35, but we should have a time for discussion. So um, I'm going to uh, conclude with some notions of the self. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I want to suggest that, uh, as many philosophers have pointed out, Gananatho Vesekre, the Sri Lankan anthropologist, for example, um, that the idea of uh, the self as an individual, individual autonomous self is something that's fairly new. The idea of personhood exists across cultures, but the idea of the self as something that, as, as the individual autonomous separate self is something that is produced after the enlightenment as the proper status of the adult. Now, um, so this is the key notion central to Western modernity that enables the common sense assumptions about the self. Uh, but perhaps if we start thinking that in non-Western societies, the notion of the individual separate from all other individuals is still not an uncontested one. And the myth that I talked about suggests that. Um, uh, that in fact, in non-Western societies, there, there remains a sense of self that is produced at the intersection of individuated bodies and collectivities of different sorts. Now, if we take this idea seriously, we can provincialize in the Peshakavati sense, even the idea of sex, different it's, uh, sex difference itself. Was sex gender a universally relevant criterion of social differentiation at all? That is, did all societies at all times, in all places, make male-female distinctions that sustain themselves over stable bodies? And uh, we find very interesting work by African feminist, Nigerian scholar Ironke Oibumi, Ifi Amadiume. Um, they actually argue that uh, Sex differences were assumed by Western scholars who, for example, studied uh, the Yoruba. Uh, Yoruba language was gender-free. Yoruba had terms for spouse, which was not 
translatable into husband and wife, ruler was not king, but in the whole process of translating and looking at Yoruba society, seeing Yoruba society, colonialism produced gender. So according to her, the hierarchy that existed was of seniority, not of gender. Um, and you find in the Indian context reading Dalit autobiographies, for example. If you, so the, uh, the autobiography as the story of the individual self is not what you see in, for that matter, African-American narratives as well, which, which could be the Global South and the Global North. So Dalit autobiographies are also very strongly inflected by community identification. It's not about how I grew up to become an adult male or female, but it's about communities. Uh, and we see this unstable sense of self in narratives of indigenous peoples too. Writing on the Ayoreo of South America, Benno Glauser points to the intrinsic incommensurability of the two universes, that is of the social scientists and the indigenous people of uh, South America. Our knowledge is fragmented, he says, representing a fragmented world. The Ayoreo discur discur discourse, in turn, always refers to an entire reality in its wholeness and speaks about concrete events, people, etc. So he finally had to recognize that it was an absurd pretension to think that he could write about his conversations with the Ayoreo in methodological terms acceptable to the academy. He found he had to abandon his method. In conclusion, what thinking the Global South involves is attempting to bring into conversation with one another, as I have attempted to do, concepts and categories that have emerged from different spatio-temporal locations. This conversation would have to be produced with the sharp awareness of incommensurability, mistranslation, productive misreading, and above all, and always, the awareness of materiality and the politics of location. Thank you.